everyone. Thank you for being here with us tonight on Martin Luther King Jr. Day for our art and activism filled event, Overcoming a Gallery Night inspired by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. featuring the work of artist, activist, and writer, Reinald Ponder, Princeton class of 1981. I'm Judy Jarvis, Director of the Office of Winter Session and Campus Engagement, or OC as we call ourselves, and this event is part of the second ever university-wide Winter Session. Winter Session is a two-week period in January, every January from now on, in which undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, and staff can all lead Winter Session workshops and events, attend Winter Session workshops and events, or all of the above. In OC, we're all about exploration, learning for the joy of learning, and connection across roles and identities. So it's really an honor to have Reinald Ponder here with us tonight. I thank you all in the audience for being here, whether you're watching us live or joining us later. I also want to thank the Arts Council of, of Princeton and their fantastic team who have worked with us closely to plan this event. It's been a pleasure working with the Arts Council and Reinald every step of the way. So with that, I will hand it over to the Artistic Director for the Arts Council of Princeton, Maria Evans, to introduce Reinhold more fully and get our event started. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And thank you for working with the Arts Council of Princeton on the Winter Session event. As Judy mentioned, I'm the Artistic Director for the Arts Council of Princeton, and the best part of my job is getting to know local artists and their work. Tonight, we are featuring one of these local amazing artists, Reinhold Ponder. I've known Reinald for years and his accomplishments are many. Not only is he a dynamic, thought-provoking artist, but an activist, a writer, curator, lawyer, father, husband, and a beloved, highly respected person in our community. Reinald is very involved in social justice, race, and art, art matters, such as the founding of Art Against Racism in 2020, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to employ art to inspire others and to end racism and build an anti-racist society. He is also a founding member of Princeton Makes, a newly established artist cooperative located at the Princeton Shopping Center and is a co-founder of Princeton Parents for Black Children, which advocates for equity for all black children in the Princeton School District to name just a few. Reinald is a Princeton University graduate and went on to NYU where he achieved his Juris Doctorate. His work on nonprofit boards and community organizations is extensive, presiding over the Board of Trustees at the Tony Award winning Crossroads Theater. I met Reinald when he served on the Arts Council Board and currently have the pleasure of working with him on our gallery committee. Reinald is a co creator, a co curator along with Judy Brodsky on a very exciting show we have coming up in the fall of 2022, Retrieving James Wilson Edwards and a Forgotten Circle of Black Artists. I really, I, I could go on, but I want us to get to Reinald and his beautiful work. We have many pieces of Reinald's on display in the show, Overcoming, Reflections on Struggle, Resilience and Triumph now on view until March 5th in our Sally Lobby Gallery, and it's located on the second floor of the Paul Robeson Building. I would highly recommend everyone stopping by to see the work, and you can learn more on our website at artscouncilofprinceton.org. Turning it over to you, Reinald, and thank you everyone for attending tonight. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, thank you, Maria and also my friends at the Arts Council of Princeton. And I also like to extend gratitude to the Office of Winter Session, uh, especially uh, Alexandra Parado and Judy Jarvis, and always extend thanks to my wife of 26 years, Michelle Tuck Ponder, who has uh, overcome, actually more like tolerating, uh, my obsession with my art practice during exhibition time. I'd like to begin with a couple of trigger warnings. Uh, we're about to deal with a number of very difficult uh, issues. And, and it's possible that I might intentionally slip and use the N-word. I hope that you receive that within context and understand that it's said without malice. Uh, another trigger warning is that you may hear a little bit more than you desire about Princeton University. 
uh, because this was originally a program exclusively for Princeton intercession, but fortunately it's now virtual and public. And in addition to that, I'm a member of the class of 81. Uh, so although I do bleed red, if you scratch me, uh, you might not see white skin instead, you might see a little bit of orange and black. Overcoming, reflections on struggle, resilience and triumph. What you're now looking at is, are some of my uh, paintings that are now on exhibition at the Arts Council. If you have the opportunity, you should really go and check them out because the images, the images always look different live. April 4th, 1968, I was nine years old. I was on that particular day, I know I was really, really very happy. Everything just seemed, just seemed exciting up until about five o'clock uh, during the day because I was playing around with my four, uh, four of my siblings. My uh, mother and father were in the TV room watching television. It was, it was great. Until all of a sudden, there was a loud scream. Oh my God, they killed him. Dr. King is dead. Ran to the TV room. There were People were crying in this anguish. You started to hear the, the crying in, throughout the, the building, then on the streets, throughout the city, throughout the nation. And although his death rocked the nation and the world, it seemed rather personal in our household because my father, attended Morehouse University at the age of 15. And he was a contemporary of King's. And he would talk often about King in the household and his, their shared mentor, ben, the revered Benjamin E. Mays, and his friends like Lerone Bennett, who eventually became a great historian and executive editor of, of Ebony with Johnson Publishing Company. My father was a loving kind of guy, always hugging us. Uh, he, was a, he was a good guy, but with bad habits. And one of those habits, an innocuous one, was that he would play the same record all the time, over and over again, despite the fact he had this huge collection and the Sylvania wicker, TV, wicker stereo. He'd get into these periods. Sometimes he would play Frank Sinatra. I did it my way, ringing throughout the house. Then he'd put on Richard Pryor. That nigga's crazy. Yes. But most of the time, he was playing Dr. Martin Luther King records, which were produced by Barry Gordy and Motown. And he would walk around the house quoting King, saying things like, and James Russell Lowell was right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. But it is truth that sways the future. If only that were true. He was born in Quitman, Georgia, which is in Brooks County in around 1929, I believe it was 1929. And Brooks County was uh, one of the highest spots for lynching Black people from 1877 to 1950. They lynched 20 Black men, or no, excuse me, 20 Black people in Brooks County during that period. Talk a little bit about my mother. My mother is from Port Gibson, Mississippi in Claiborne County, which is abutted right up against Louisiana. And it's surrounded by about five contiguous uh, uh, counties. In that area, amongst those counties, 
during that same period, and my mother was born in 1935, 77 black bodies were lynched, racial terror. And it made me think, as I start, when I started to paint, what kind of trauma were my parents facing? It's something you don't think about as a kid. You're just thinking about yourself. What kind of trauma was my mother facing? And just talk a little bit about my mother because we're talking about overcoming and success. And unfortunately for us and my mother, my father's other bad habits was that he was an alcoholic and he was abusive. So at some point, right before I was coming to Princeton, he had to leave. He had to be asked to leave. And that left my mother with eight children to raise. And she would always tell us, look, your situation is not your destination. And she then prove it because at the end of the day for her, she wanted to make sure that her children were educated. And she became quite popular because she achieved that. Next slide. My mother made sure that all eight of her children attended college and not only attended college, but received multiple degrees. They went to schools like Princeton University, my brother, actually two of us, my brother joined us, Northwestern, University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, Illinois State, on, on and on. And she showed us what it meant to triumph and whatever the trauma she had, whatever you makes you wonder what trauma does a mother keep from you, but also what trauma does she transfer to you unintentionally? The first painting that you're seeing is Mafa. And Mafa is means great tragedy. And in this case, the African Holocaust. We lost over 2 million African lives, human lives, during the Middle Passage. And so one of the things that I like to do with my art is to create narratives so that when you go to the piece, you're, you're not just looking at it for whether it's beautiful or it looks good or not, but you're hopefully drawn in to the story. And as you look at this, and as I look at this painting, I wonder what is happening to this mother? Here she is drowning. How did she get there? How did she get into this situation? Is she escaping? Is she, was she thrown overboard? What's happening to the baby? The baby is already in fluid. It's already in, in water. When does it die? How long does it live? So narratives are very important to me and to bring us to humanize what we want to ignore. We are constantly trying to hide this history. But it's important to humanize for me and to do it in a way that perhaps is beautiful, perhaps to make ugly beautiful. This is Gordon or Whip Peter. And talk about revelations and trying to bring out that which is hidden. We know that 12.5 million Africans were shipped from Africa to many places, including the islands and the US, and most of the Africans were shipped to South America. We know that they were terrorized in order to work. Although some people are constantly giving us these stories about, oh, they, 
live happy lives. They, they had shelter, they had jobs, but we know they were terrorized. And there is not much pictorial evidence of that. When you Google, you see most just this one picture, and they don't even know who this one person is. So I decided that I needed to, I wanted to do some art that would show that there were more than this one person that was terrorized, that was beaten. And so I created another series called Peloids and Scars. What I did was I decided that I was going to make a leather canvas. So I went to a resale store, purchased a bunch of coats, cut up the coats. Uh, my wife, the, the great quilter that she is, go to ponder, um, ponderful, ponderful quilts. The great quilter that she is, she sewed them up. I took the uh, new canvas, wrapped it, wrapped it around the frame. Then I actually, because it was too loose, I wrapped them and glued them to pre-made canvases to make them tauter and tighter. I screwed a small hook on the neck. I took a rope and hooked it on the hook. I took it outside. I hung it on a tree. And I apply a lot of tools and utensils to make marks on my work. I use spoons, I use knives, I use pizza cutters. I like the pizza cutter, it makes a very nice line. But for this particular painting, I decided to use a whip. So I took this whip, I dipped it in red paint, and then I proceeded to beat it like it was a slave and like I was his master. And I had two things that came out of that for me. One, it was a terrible, horrifying experience. I cannot tell you how horrible I felt. But as I whipped that body, that canvas, I felt a surge of power and energy that forced me to keep whipping it and made me think of what demented minds slave masters had. And it was the parallel of when an officer has a gun and they shoot a human being 58 times, 40 times, 13 times, unarmed. What is the energy that is going through your body, going through your heart? As I said, I paint in series. And so I wanted to paint as many of these as I feel or as I want. But I didn't want to just show the pain and the suffering. I wanted to somehow figure out how do I show the resilience and that we triumph in our resistance through the scars. So I decided to collage tattoos or to make a tattoo. And that tattoo was a collage. And so on this particular piece, and I tell artists they should never say what I'm about to say, so I'm breaking my rule, but I really don't like this painting. It always, before I exhibit it, I say to myself, do I really want to exhibit this? Because it's not the orderly painting that I like to do. It's all over the place. But then when I go to pick up the painting, 
I can't help myself but be drawn in and understand that our resistance, our lives in this institutionalized racist place is a mess. And that this picture for me aptly portrays that, which contains my Angelou poems, I rise, I rise, I rise, despite the keloids and the scars. This is abstract, actually inward Tulsa. I did a, I had a exhibition called The Rise and Fell of the Inward. I don't really have time to go into it in greater depth, but the purpose of it was to deal with the N-word because we do not have a public language by which to discuss race. And I wanted to attack it at its very core. And this particular painting, which was I did before we really had these discussions about Tulsa and the race riots, was I wanted to begin to have a discussion and to re, have us rediscover what groups, large groups of whites did to black communities. They, people talked about us in stereotypes that we didn't want to accomplish, that we couldn't do certain things. But when we built wealth and when we built communities, some whites were angry and jealous and they destroyed not just Tulsa, but Chicago. Wilmington, Camden, and they called those race riots. They called those race riots as though they weren't massacres and that black people were at fault. So the significance of this one for this particular exhibit, because it has nigger all over it, and because I was putting the painting in the Arts Council and I wanted to put the painting in the Arts Council, I covered up the word nigger. And for this exhibit, I covered it up with what I thought was appropriate, Band-Aids. Now, because without us dealing with, the discuss with these issues, we are constantly putting Band-Aids to hide our problems. Now, in this particular case, uh, seriously, I hope I didn't destroy my painting because uh, it fell off when I put it on with fabric glue and I had to actually then put on real Band-Aids. Uh, but I thought it was quite appropriate for this particular discussion. Next slide, did I? Hands up, don't shoot, shot, damn, three. Another series. I wanted to create, there were so many killings of un unarmed people. Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, on and on, that I felt I wanted to create a symbol, like a stop sign. It was so prevalent, like a stop sign. And so I started to do these panels separately with the hopes of doing a panel for every killing. Unfortunately, I could not keep up. Between 2015 and 2021, there, and there were over 5,000 police killings. And that doesn't include, that includes uh, armed killings, et cetera. But that is how prevalent killing people for police is in, in this country. So I, I couldn't keep up with the unarmed killings. So this is a representation of that. And when you go into the gallery, you'll see these targets, these multiple targets, which goes back to what I was saying to you about the whip. How can you constantly just shoot people so many times? Regarding the narrative, I did 
you'll find or you'll see a long version of this. And at the end of the narrative, the space is reserved. This is Trayvon Martin, a play on Trayvon and Martin Luther King. Uh, the Martin hoodie is inspired by the artist Nicholas Smith, who did it before I did. Uh, I did a different version, uh, but I wanted to obviously make the comparison. I'm going to speed up just a little bit because I like to leave time for uh, questions. I wanted us to think about what has us or allows us to get through this. And a large part of it is faith. We don't want to deny that there's great joy despite the pain, that there is faith which Dr. King talked about often, that things will be better, that life will be better if we fight and we work for it. So that's a representation of that. Although all African-Americans are not Baptists, we have Muslims, we have Jehovah Witnesses, we have a great variety. But this happens to be the church scene that I uh, painted. Uh, the reason it's named Love Theory is because I was painting this uh, during uh, a Kirk Franklin festival, which I held uh, like my father and played it over and over and over. Yeah. And my wife was bothering me about that. And this is the last piece that I'll talk about. Uh, the Please forgive the the image is an iPhone image, but it goes back to my mother. And for me, black women, black women being the backbone of America, being the backbone of the universe, this was inspired by a combination of Beatrice Gernstein. She does globes and I wanted to do something that was sculptural and Alvin Ailey. I'll talk, I'll talk very briefly about Art Against Racism. Uh, Maria did a great job in talking about it. It's an organization that I started to, uh, to promote artists, uh, to promote artists that wanted to uh, deal with racism, social issues, uh, art, social work uh, has become social artwork has become a bit more prevalent uh, and I wanted to expose more people to, to the world. Our mission, however, is to fight racism, try to eliminate racism and build an anti-racist society through art. This particular picture is one of our exhibitions. Uh, and what I try to do with our exhibitions is tie them into activist work. It's important for me that all of our exhibitions move us forward to that anti-racist society. So I don't brag often, but I have to brag about this because the picture on the, it's on my right, so it's on your right. The picture on the right is probably the best event uh, for me of our first exhibition in 2019, where we had artists respond to the theme, Art Against Racism. And that was before we were an organization. And one of our events was predominantly white churches invited predominantly black and Latino churches to breakfast on Sunday, which Malcolm has said is the most segregated hour in America. But when these people came together, they didn't come apart. Later, they, they started to work together. They held Juneteenth together. They have a Bible study together. 
Uh, and and I am absolutely thrilled to have been part of that. And right now we have an exhibition at the West Windsor Arts Council. Entitled Beloved Community. I mean, I'm sorry, entitled Manifesting Beloved Community, which challenged artists to do work, to create work, which saw, which tried to consider in the future what a healthy global society would look like. One that was economically just and was fair to everybody. So I'm going to stop there with Art Against Racism. And I want to conclude with this. Uh, Shelly, where, where am I? Yeah. I want to conclude, and I, I have to read this, and please forgive me because I'm not totally sure that I'll get through it uh, without crying. Um, I want to, and, I, and I'm doing this because this is the Princeton crew largely. I want to conclude by talking about the loss of one of my contemporaries. You'll read about him soon in the Princeton Alumni Weekly. His name is Jonathan C. Smith, class of 1981. He came to Princeton from Harvey, Illinois, and I met him at April Holsting, uh, and entered the summer program with him, which is now FLI. He recently died in June 2021. He led a wonderful life filled with joy, activism, loving, talented family, tons of friends. And so impactful was his life that St. Louis University named the amphitheater and the scholarship after him. But back in the day, the black contingent from Chicago, even though he was from Harvey, he was considered to be from Chicago, uh, was close. And Jonathan and I had a number of things in common. And one of them was that we were black nerds right before we entered the gates on Nassau Hall. And then we became two of the coolest dudes in the world because we were from Chicago in our minds. So, but I'm not gonna rat him out because he's not here. Uh, and, but I had the pleasure of meeting his prominent and strong family during my freshman year, during a snowstorm in Chicago, and I was stuck in his house for a couple of days. And I recall quite correctly that his, his father marched, worked, and went to jail with Dr. Martin Luther King. Now, me, I wasn't that cool either. I know some of my senior friends will say when I came to school in April Holsting, that I came in a pleather jacket with a toothpick in my mouth, claiming that I was not going to go to Princeton, that I was going to Northwestern. Well, I decided to go to Princeton. My father wanted me to go to Morehouse. Thank God that Morehouse could not afford me, kind of like my paintings. But Jonathan and I were fairly close. And the reason I mentioned Jonathan is because he was a great orator. And I could talk a little bit, but Jonathan and I decided to, as a tandem, that we, for our talent shows at the Third World Center, I would read a speech. I would act out a speech from Dr. Martin Luther King, which was I Had a Dream, and he would do Ballad and the Bullet, Malcolm X. And I think it probably should have been reversed. I think I was really the Malcolm X guy, and he was the King guy at the time. But I could love the crescendo of one of King's speeches, the, of, of the I Had a Dream speech that ended with free at last, free at last, thank God almighty, free at last. And I, at the end of that speech, I, I could barely hear anyone because I was so wrapped up into it. But that was not my favorite speech. That was not my favorite line of his speeches. It was when he talked about his fear on April 3rd, 1968. And he was in his sermon on the podium, he talked about how, I'm sorry, I need to switch slides.
he talked about how he was not going to stop because of his fear. How he had seen the mountaintop. I might as well just read it. He said, well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter to, with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. I just want to do God's will and he's allowed me to the mountaintop. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And so when you stand in front of my art in that exhibit, I hope that it is more than an attraction for you, but it stirs in you a desire to understand exactly where you stand. Where are your feet pointed? Where's your heart pointed? Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm now going to turn it over to Alex for questions. Thank you, Reinhold, for your very powerful and touching presentation. Um, I'm excited to be a part of this sharing moment with you. Um, so we do have a few questions from the audience, and I'll pin the first one here. So when did you be begin your art practice, and how have you been inspired to use different mediums to represent the historical and contemporary experiences of Blackness in America? So I'm inspired by everything. I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Chicago is one of the most segregated cities, or it was when I was growing up. Uh, I think the other ones were Boston and Philadelphia, and I've lived in both of those, too. Uh, I started painting when I was in high school. I majored in commercial art. Uh, I was trained by artists who are uh, now actually being revered. They were just teachers then. Uh, uh, they were members of Obasi, the organization of, I actually can't remember the exact name, but it was very, uh, very cultural organization. They taught us poetry. They taught us art. Uh, and I didn't really start to uh, take this stage of my practice seriously until 2002 when my mother uh, died of cancer. And uh, as many, uh, as too many of you might know, uh, when parents uh, die, uh, you start to reconsider uh, aspects of your own life. And uh, I actually have been compa uh, col compiling or collecting paints all ever since high school. Uh, and when I decided to do it full time, I had a lot of paints. Thank you. What kind of pushback have you received? <laughs> that is another talk. <laughs> well, let, let's see, what can I say in short? Uh, actually, I've had great receptions because uh, in context, we're able to have some very good discussions. Uh, I, I absolutely have had pushback on uh, the using the word nigger in, in work, uh, but the pushback has almost always ended up in fantastic discussions, so much so that uh, my exhibit in, I first exhibit the N-word in 2014 at the Carl Field Center. I think it was Carl Field Center then. And uh, out of that grew a Facebook discussion page called Beyond Black and White, which now has 7,000 members mm -hmm. and is basically run by three brilliant women uh, who are who curate uh, the discussions uh, on race and culture and politics. Uh, but uh, the most significant pushback, which I can't tell you the full story because we really don't have time, was my daughter getting suspended for uh, having a, taking a picture with her friends in front of one of my black on black N word paintings. That ended up in a war and my wife ended up running for the school board. Wow, thank you. Um, we have one question here from Gustavo. 
How much do you think your art will impact racial equality advocacy in the future? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, it, it can only make as much impact as it impacts people. So I have and inspires people to work. And that's one reason I created Art Against Racism, though, because it's not just my artwork. It's 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 the artwork of the globe. It's, it's everybody's artwork. There are so many of us out here cr creating work where we're trying to express not only the type of society that we want to live in, but how tired we are of the racial animus. Uh, and uh, so it, it's not just I'm not alone. So I, I don't know, but I'm not alone. Thank you. So we do have uh, a, a few more minutes for a couple more questions. So please type in any questions you'd like to ask Reinald, but I have a question for myself. Sure. So Reinald, you shared uh, the piece that you liked least. Can you <laughs> share your favorite piece from this gallery? I actually don't have a favorite piece. Okay. Uh, but someone just offered to buy Mafa. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, and a, a question came up here. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're curating with Judy Brodsky? Uh, so looking forward to that. Oh, I, uh, I have had such pleasure, first of all, working with the Princeton, uh, the Arts Council of Princeton. Uh, those folks are great. I love them, uh, which is why I'm on the gallery committee. <laughs> uh, and I have had equal or more pleasure in working with Judy Brodsky, who was my co-chair when I decided to do Memorial Monument Movement, uh, which I didn't talk about because of, of the time, and I want you to ask, be able to ask questions, but Memorial Monument Movement uh, was an exhibition, was our first exhibition of, of, of the formalized Art Against Racism. I actually was not going to do another Art Against Racism exhibition after the first one in 2019 uh, because it was too much work. Mm -hmm. and, and I had, but I had great partners from Morvin, McCarter, churches around town, uh, but it was just too much work. Then George Floyd died. And George Floyd died and people all over the world were expressing themselves through art. And I presented an idea to a couple of people, <clears throat> including Judy and Judy, it, it, uh, who has a school named after her, which was first at Rutgers. And, and I didn't know this when we were talking. Uh, and, and now at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, her mind is so expansive. When you give her an idea, she's, she's like me. She runs with it. And so, uh, and, it, and it becomes bigger. And that one became international. And we collected works, including murals and archive, uh, because we want to archive those works. Uh, and share them with the world. Judith and I are on the gallery committee at the Arts Council, and we've been working on a project focused on uh, James Edwards and a cadre of black artists that were here in the uh, uh, late to mid 20th, of 20th century, here being in Princeton for those. Uh, uh, and, and they uh, included Rex Gorley uh, and James Edwards and Huey Lee Smith, and we wanted to bring them back and re-expose them to, to people uh, and to the world and to give them their due, which they did not have. Selma Burks, uh, just a, a great cadre of artists. And we were fortunate enough to recently receive a, a $40,000 grant from the NEA. Uh, we're very excited and, uh, we're, and we're working with Princeton University and the Princeton Historical Society. It is going to be so fabulous and so many uh, uh, aspects to that program. And uh, I, I look forward to sharing, with, with, sharing it with you all. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. Um, we have our last question here for you, Reinald. So do you see art as a form of activism, even art created in the past? Uh, apps, it can be. Mm. Not all art is a form of activism, but absolutely. Uh, but I, again, one of the reasons I created Art Against Racism is that art can be a tool hmm. of activism. Uh, it can serve many purposes. It inspires. It can serve. It can communicate. And, and that's probably the most important thing to me is that 
things that we can't say, art can create languages and cross barriers. Absolutely. So, so it, it, it's a tool that serves many, many purposes. Well, thank you, Reinhold. Um, thank you for answering all these amazing questions. And again, thank you for sharing your gallery with us tonight. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight for this virtual gallery inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, Reinhold's gallery will be on view until March 5th at the Arts Council of Princeton. So make sure you stop by if you can. Uh, for those participating in winter session, thank you so much. We hope to see you at our other evening events. On Friday, January 21st, we have the continuation of our unexpected conversation series featuring Dr. Eddie Glaude, Joe Scarsborough, and Mika Brzezinski. Um, on Saturday evening, we have Beyond the Resume with Allison Felix and Ford Family Director of Athletics, John Mack, and that's at 6 p.m. And lastly, at 9 p.m., we have a magic show by RJ the Magician um, that evening. So thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful evening.